Sugarland Church of Christ Gospel Revival Meeting. The series of preaching is coming under the theme, The Time Is Now, from the Book of Hagar. And we thank you for tuning in this week. We're looking forward to a great night in the Lord. Tonight's message and speaker will certainly be a, a blessing to all of us. I hope you're ready to hear God's infallible word and from God's servant. Minister Chris Jackson of the Jackson Street Church of Christ in Nashville, Tennessee. I will be introducing Brother Jackson later in this revival meeting. Again, welcome to tonight's session in this great gospel series. If you have any questions, please contact us by email at info at slcoc.org or you can call the church office 281-561-0881 and someone will respond to your request. If you're in our area, please contact us. Give us a call. We love to have you as guests in our worship service. Please visit our website, www.slcoc.org for more information. Shall we together pray? Our great God and Father who you are, we humbly approach thy throne of grace, asking for your mercy and your forgiveness of those things that we have done contrary to your will. We're thankful for your son Jesus who died on that cross, showed us how we should live while living here amongst us. We ask that we become better disciples because of the teachings of him through example. 
We pray for those who are in bereavement this day that you will give them comfort and peace during this most difficult time in their lives. We pray for those who are ill that you will comfort them and give them the strength that they so desire. Please be with Brother Jackson as he breaks unto us the bread of life this evening, that we take it and use it as part of our everyday lives. We also ask that for the young people that we continue to keep them in, their, in our prayers and work with them to better understand the teachings of the Lord. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Let us all say amen. There is beyond the answer blue I journey through the land I'll be seen. 
ain't getting there. As I go, well, I will be pointing so to Calvary to the crimson flow where mid me arrows fill my soul from without within. Well, but my yes, it leads me on and through here. My soul will sing it now. Oh, I wanna see him. I just wanna look upon. Yeah.
am here this evening to introduce to you Brother Christopher Jackson. Brother Jackson served under the leadership of Alvin L. Daniels, Jr., minister of the Hope Church of Christ. Brother Jackson's emphasis and passion is on church method methodology so that church can be positioned for growth in the future. He has already given advice to church leaders, churches on systems and processes that help facilitate church growth. Brother Jackson has been preaching for 17 years and serves as a full-time minister of Cortland Avenue Church for eight years and is currently serving as the minister of Church Christ at Jackson Street in Nashville, Tennessee. Chris Jackson is married to the former Andrea Chapman, and they have been married for 17 years. They have one child, Grayson. Again, thank you for your attention, and we pray that something will be said to inspire you along your Christian walk this evening. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Brother Christopher Jackson from the Jackson Street Church of Christ here in Nashville, Tennessee. We want to, first of all, thank God for this opportunity to speak on this great gospel meeting slash revival for the Sugar Land Church of Christ. I'm grateful to your minister, Brother Parker, not only Brother Parker, but also the shepherds of this great congregation for gracing me this opportunity to speak to you all from God's engrafted and holy word. Come with me in a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we come on this day, for we know, Father, that it is because of you, Father, that we live, we move, and we have our very being. And Father, at this moment, Father, I ask that you bring back to remembrance the things I've studied, that you will touch my mind and touch the words of my mouth. And Father, that not only will you touch my mind and touch the words of my mouth, but that you will touch also those who will be hearing this lesson, that it may find fertile soil in their hearts. We give you all the glory and honor for us in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Come with me to Haggai chapter two. Haggai chapter two. Verses 20 through 23. In Haggai chapter two. Verses 20 through 23. These words are written. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judea, saying, I will shake the heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kings. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shetel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Press me for a sermonic theme. I would tell you a whole lot of shaking going on. A whole lot of shaking going on. Due to COVID, many of us have a can of Lysol spray probably at our house or at our office. And some of us, before we spray, there are sometimes we shake the can before we spray. Not only that, but you are familiar with shaking orange juice or shaking some type of juice before you drink it. And even in your days in the past when you were 
not a child of God, when you would go to certain functions and you would shake your body. But thanks be to God that you no longer do that. And so we are familiar with the concept of to shake or shaking. In our text, we read about God saying he's going to do some shaking. And what I want to do just for a few minutes is to show you what does it mean when God says, I'm a shake, heavens and earth. Not only what does it mean, but how does it apply to us? And I will tell you that if you listen and apply this sermon to you, it will give you hope in the midst of when life is indeed bad and it appears as if it's not getting any better. So as you walk with me through these few verses, I do not need to go back and give you a background of the book of Haggai because I know the speakers who have come before me have done a magnificent job giving you the backdrop of the book of Haggai and what was taking place. So with that being said, we can jump right to verse 20. In verse number 20, you have God directing this particular message, not to a group, but a specific individual. That individual would be the governor called Zerubbabel. The first and the fourth vision that God spoke through Haggai was for individuals. The first message being for Zerubbabel and Joshua, this last one being for Zerubbabel. And this fourth message, this final message that is delivered through Haggai to Zerubbabel, it is the second time that Haggai has received, or this is the second message Haggai has received on the same day letting you know how important this day was. This is the second message he receives on the same day. And so he speaks to Zerubbabel and, and by saying, and again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month saying, speak to Zerubbabel, the governor, the political leader of Judea, saying, I will shake heaven and earth when the Lord says that I'm going to shake heaven and the earth God is letting Haggai know to tell Zerubbabel that I'm going to make my presence felt I will demonstrate my power I am going to intervene in the affairs of heaven and earth in other words the idea is is that God says that that even though I sit high I am involved in the affairs of mankind and I will show my power if you look at verse number 22 God demonstrates how he's going to show his power he says I will overthrow the throne of the kingdoms and I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. And so what God, what God does, God uses four verbs that demonstrate his power, that demonstrate the fact that his, his presence will be seen in the fact that he says, I'm going to shake, I'm going to overthrow he uses that word twice then he says I'm going to destroy now why would God in this point in history or on this day in that season why would God demonstrate his power well if you want to know why God would demonstrate his power you need to look at verse 23 in verse 23 the Bible says that in that day says the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies, the Lord of the heavenly armies. Um, the idea is, is that God is going to demonstrate his power for two reasons. Reason number one, God says, I'm going to show the world. I'm going to show the Gentile nations that I'm still in control. In other words, Zerubbabel, um, you need to know that even though my people are not in a dominant position, 
even though they are under the authority and rule of Persia, one day God says, I'm going to show the kingdoms of this world that I am the one who is sovereign. I am the one who is in control. I am the one that's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Well, God, if you are Lord of Lord and Kings of Kings, if you are sovereign, how are you going to show your sovereignty, show your power? In verse 22, God says that I'm going to overthrow. I'm going to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. In other words, those who are in power, who think they have the power, God says, I'm going to overthrow. Not only am I going to overthrow, but I'm going to destroy their strength. And not only that, but I'm also going to overthrow the chariots. And so God is saying that, that I'm going to show that I'm in control by what I do. And if we could do a little Bible study, when we see that word overthrow, you begin to see it over in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 29, but also in Amos chapter 4 and verse number 11. If we go to Amos chapter 4 and verse number 11, you will see the prophet Amos use this because the word overthrow or overthrew carries a connotation of judgment. That, that whenever God overthrows, whenever God overthrew somebody, God was judging them. God was bringing down on them the penalty they deserve for their actions. And even Amos recognizes that concept with the word overthrow or overthrew because he quotes or he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. So in Amos 4, in verse number 11, Amos would say, God speaking through Amos would say, I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. In other words, just like how God overthrew, God destroyed, overthrew, God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, God says that I'm going to show that I am the one who rules over the kingdoms of the world because one day I will judge all nations. And so he is letting Zerubbabel know to encourage, um, to encourage him that judgment is coming. And when judgment is coming, God will judge the nations. Well, you probably wondering, how does God judging the nations benefit a child of God? How will God bringing judgment on the world when that day happens, when, 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 when the Lord descends from the sky and when we hear the trump of God and when the dead in Christ shall rise first, how does that help me? How does that encourage me? I'm glad you asked because over in 2 Peter chapter 3 and round verse number 11 in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 11, Peter is talking about the day of the Lord, is talking about judgment and Peter says, therefore, since all of these things will be dissolved, talking about um, the elements in the sky, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? In other words, Peter says, since judgment is coming and some stuff is going to be set on fire, how do you think you need to be when that happens? He says in verse number 12, I'm looking for, in other words, not being afraid of, but looking for and hastening, uh, 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 wanting the Lord to come on back, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. In other words, we are looking forward to that day. We can't wait till that day arrive. Why? Because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will, met, will melt with fervent heat. Verse 13, in verse 13 he says, nevertheless, this is the encouraging part. Even though some stuff going to be on fire, even though some stuff is going to be destroyed, 
Peter says, nevertheless, we according to his promise. We look for new heavens and a new earth which righteousness dwells. Peter says that we're looking forward to that day because we know that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. What is, what's going to be new about everything? It's going to be a place where righteousness dwells. Peter is saying that you should be looking forward to judgment because when judgment happens, only thing that's going to be after judgment in this new heaven, new earth is things that are right. That should put a smile on your face because we know that the world we live in, the kingdoms of this world, we know that racism exists. But when Jesus comes back and when judgment happens and when we think about how heaven is going to be, there will be no more racism. There will be no more crime. I know somebody's listening You've lost a loved one due to crime. You've, you've been hurt before. You have had racism demonstrated towards you. You've had people lie on you before. You've had people to let you down. You've had people to try to tear down your reputation. We look forward to the day when there will be no more evil, that we will be treated right, that we don't have to look over our shoulders. We don't have to worry about locking the doors. We don't have to worry about carrying protection on us. We don't have to worry about those who've been called to protect us, mistreat us. We look forward to the day when all evilness is gone. And so he tells Zerubbabel that listens to Zerubbabel that God will bring judgment and, will God, and when God brings judgment it's going to be an encouraging thing because God will deal with all the injustice that takes place. Because sometimes when we look at life and we see all the evilness, all the crookedness, all the hatred, all the bad things, we ask the same thing as Habakkuk asked. In other words, God, where are you? Why is the law paralyzed? But he lets the river bell know that it won't always be like this. If I can give you an illustration to show this, I'm going to give you an illustration, give you a biblical illustration that shows God is ultimately in control and God brings down judgment on the kings of the world. If you remember, there was a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the most powerful person on the globe at that time. And you remember Nebuchadnezzar had a, had a dream, had a nightmare, had a dream. And, and in his dream, he saw a tree but he saw somebody cutting down the tree and leaving it at his stump. And you remember Nebuchadnezzar called Daniel and, and Daniel would interpret this dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 25, Daniel begins to give Nebuchadnezzar some of the high points of what this dream meant. He tells Nebuchadnezzar that they shall drive you from me. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar you're going to leave the palace. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. You're going to live out there with the animals. And he's talking to the most powerful man in the world. And they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, you are going to act like an animal. And he's not talking about um, he's not playing around. He's talking about literally you're going to lose your mind and begin to behave like an animal. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over you. This is not going to be something that's going to last for a little while. It's going to take a while that this is going to happen to you. You're going to be in this condition for a while. Seven times shall pass over you till you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whomever he chooses. Daniel says, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, the reason why God is going to judge you because you need to know who is in charge all alone. You need to know that while you may be high on the earth, 
there is a most high that's higher than you and even though you make choices in Babylon and across the earth you need to know that there is a king that rules even over you and you live you move you have your very being because of him and he gives power to whomever he chooses so when God talks about shaking about overthrowing God is highlighting that that I'm the one I'm going to show him one day that I'm the one who's still in control and my control will be seen when I bring judgment and when we go back to Haggai chapter 2 in verse number 22 if I can give you this second point if I can give you this second point as a matter of fact verse 23 in verse 23 if I can give you this second point and we will the lesson will be yours. He says, in that day. Whenever you see the phrase, in that day, it's talking about the end of times. In, 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 in that day. So God is not talking about something that was going to happen soon in Zerubbabel's lifetime. He's talking about long after Zerubbabel is off the scene. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheatel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Listen, there are a few, few words in here that should arrest our attention. He calls Zerubbabel my servant. Same terminology he used when he talked about, when God talks about Moses and David. So he says, my servant. And he says, for I have chosen you. Same terminology when in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse number 8 and through the life of David, how David was God's chosen anointed one, even dealing with Jesus. And so he's using terminology that, that has overtones to messianic fulfillment of prophecy. In other words, Zerubbabel would be a picture of the coming Messiah. And if we could back up even some and, and even an, another phrase that's in verse 23, he says, I will make you like a signet ring. Now, what a signet ring was, a signet ring was a ring that denoted authority. When, when Joseph was made second in charge in Egypt, Pharaoh gave Joseph a ring. That's Genesis chapter 41 and verse number 42. It, when, 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 when Joseph stood before Pharaoh, it says, then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And so a signet ring carried authority. So it was Pharaoh um, giving Joseph authority in the view of everybody. And so when God says, I'm going to put a signet ring on Zerubbabel, he's telling Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, you stand as a picture of someone who I, who I have given authority to. Not only that, but a signet ring was also used as like a signature or a seal Whenever a king would give instructions or write a letter, he would use the signet ring because it had like an emblem on it and they would put it in wax because it served as the king's seal that this is an actual letter coming from the king because we don't want anybody to plagiarize or we don't want anybody to act like or send orders in the name of the king but they were not the king so the king would seal his documents with his signet ring it would be some type of mark or emblem letting the recipient of the letter know that this actually comes from the king and so the signet ring carries an idea of authority and somebody who is authentic and so he's telling Zerubbabel you serve as a picture of my authority and you are 
authentically been given authority from me. Now, now you, you probably wondering what, what, all, oh, what does this mean in 2021? Well, well, let me let let, let me tell you. Um, Zerubbabel was from the lineage of David, and we know that that Jesus would come from the family of David. And, and in Jeremiah chapter 22, in Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse number 24, um, one of David's descendants, the king, um, Coniah, he, uh, Jaconum, some versions say Jaconum, um, Jaconum was a wicked king. And even though he was in the lineage of David, God makes, uh, makes this prediction. And this prediction has serious ramifications. God would tell this king many years before Zerubbabel comes on the scene that as I live, says the Lord, though Jeconah, the son of Jehoam, Jehoam, king of Judea, were the signet on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off. I'll read that last phrase again. He says, the king of Judea were the signet on my hand, yet I would pluck you off. This king was so wicked that God says that I'm not going to have anything to do, to do with you. The promises of the Messiah coming through your family, which is the family of David. It is God saying, I'm putting that on hold right about now. Let that sink in because God had promised David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that your descendants would have sit on the throne and from his descendants would come the Christ. David's descendants became so wicked that God put a pause on that in Jeremiah 22 and verse 24. And so the idea is, is that Zerubbabel would be the grandson of this king or he would be a distant family member of this king. And so it is God pressing pause on the record in Jeremiah. And so the question would become, if God has pressed pause on his promises, is the Messiah still going to come? And God answers that with an emphatically yes, because he tells um, he tells Zerubbabel that you will be my signet ring. In other words, I took my promises off your ancestors, but I'm putting my promises back on your hand. In other words, the Messiah will still come. God, he is saying that my promises are still in effect even though they were put on pause because of the wickedness of your family, God says, I'm unpausing the record and my promises of bringing the Messiah, of me being involved in the affairs of man through Jesus, those promises are back on track. Application time and then we're going home. I will tell you that Sometimes our wickedness causes God to withhold his promises. But I'm glad that because of grace and mercy, God will give man another chance to receive his promises. And so Zerubbabel would be encouraged by knowing that even though Israel is not in a powerful position, even though Persia is in charge, even though other countries may be ruling, that God still has help on the way in the form of Jesus because his promises are still on track. And I would tell somebody on the day that I know sometimes it gets rough, but you need to know that God's promises are still true. God's promises that if you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33, 
that all these things will be added unto you that God's promises are still true. I know you may be thinking you find yourself in a difficult situation and you don't have the strength to deal with it. I stopped the day to tell you that God's promises are still true for in Philippians 4 and 13 Paul says that I can do all things or I can deal with all circumstances through Christ who strengthens me. I know you may be thinking that you don't know how you're going to make it because people have walked out on you. But I stopped the day to tell you that that Jesus said I'll never leave nor forsake you. I know you may be thinking my body is breaking down and I'm discouraged because of that. But I stopped the day to tell you that Paul said that if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have another building in the heavens not made with hand that God's promises. They're still on track. And it's because that God's promises are still on track. Even when life looks bad, I know that help is still on the way because God is sticking to his promises. I'll close with this illustration. I'll close with this illustration back in 2003. I think it was August, August 14th, 2003. There was a, a man by the name of Mr. Evans and Mrs. Evans, they were, they were at the airport in New York and they had gotten to the airport in ample enough time because they knew the line was going to be long. But on this day, the line was extremely long and, and they were in line for about 20 to 30 minutes and, and Mr. Evans say he stepped out of line and to, to see what was going on and that's when he realized that that the airport had no electricity that the the baggage line was not moving and the and, and and the belt was not operating like it should be and the computers were down and they found themselves in the midst of the blackout on the east coast particularly new york city and so now you have no planes leaving no planes coming in several thousand people at the airport and the airport would make an announcement. The airport would say that we're going to be closing. And so you don't have to go home, but you got to get up out of here. And so people begin to frantically try to find a place to stay. Place to stay. And so Mr. Evans called his sister and, and she was able to find them a, a hotel at the Crown Plaza. And the Crown Plaza told them we have one room left and we'll give you 15 minutes to make it. So Mr. and Mrs. Evans, they got in their taxi cab and they got over to the Crown Plaza just in the nick of time. And when they got to the hotel, the lights were, were off. There was no electricity. And so the hotel was, was signing people in with paper and pencil and had candles lit up. And there was no air condition. There was no hot food. And so Mr. and Mrs. Evans, when they got to their room, the room was hot and, and sweaty. And he looked out the window and across the street he saw a hotel and that hotel was the Marriott and that hotel had lights on people were in there laughing and having a good time people were in there watching TV some people were in there dancing from left to right and Mr. Evans said that I, he told his wife that 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 honey I got to go across the street to see why do they have lights while wow, we do not have lights? And so as Mr. Evans crossed the street and he went to the Marriott and as he went in there, he asked the manager who was on duty, how do you all have lights? Because I see the people eating and drinking and having a good time and watching TV and watching the news about this um, blackout. How do you all have electricity and we don't? The manager said that we have power because when this hotel was built, it was built or it was installed with a gas generator, which means that we got a power source on the inside that's not dictated by what's going on on the outside. And so she says that we got power because the blackout, the darkness, the craziness that's going on out there cannot affect what's going on in here because we're running off a different power source. I don't know who I'm talking to, but is there anybody that knows that whenever you have God's promises on the inside, in your heart, 
dwelling in your spirit that no matter what's going on on the outside, you got some joy on the inside. I got joy even though it's dark in my life. I got peace even though it's depressing out there. I got hope even though I don't know how it's going to turn out. Why? Because I got promises on the inside. And since I got promises on his inside, on the inside of it, I'm able to function even when life is bad. So remember that judgment is coming, but judgment will be a good thing for a child of God because all the evilness we've experienced will be over. And even though there are times that it seems like God's promises are not coming. Just know God will stick to his promises. May God bless you. May God keep you. And once again, thank you to Brother Parker the Fourth and also to the Sugar Land Church of Christ for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou be. Jackson, what a wonderful job, magnificent message from our Lord. What a wonderful way to end this winter sermon series. Don't want to see it come to an end, but I heard somebody say once, all good things must come to an end. But we're just, we don't want to see it end because we have, we gained so much from these series of lessons from the book of Haggai, very applicable to today's time. So thank you, Brother Jackson, for your sermon, your message tonight, and for wrapping up this sermon series. To all of our speakers, we thank you so much. Brother Justin Carter, Brother David Wilson, Brother Chris Jackson, Brother Clarence Ross, each man of God did such a mar marvelous job in proclaiming the message of salvation and hope from the pages of inspiration. So thank you so much also listening audience for tuning in with us uh, on this evening and through uh, the duration of this sermon series. And I hope, trust, and pray that you're able to share these messages. You could hit share from your Facebook page. You're able to share these messages uh, with your friends. Uh, you can always go back and listen to them uh, on our Facebook page and even on our YouTube page. And so please share these messages with others. We want to tell the world about how good that Jesus is to us and how what a mighty God that we serve. And so thank you again for tuning in with us here at Sugarland Church of Christ. Uh, as Brother Jackson mentioned, you come to Christ by hearing the message of salvation, the facts that Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again on the third day, believing that, repenting of sins, confessing, being buried in a watery grave of baptism. And we just want to extend that opportunity to you this evening. If you want to be saved, or even if you just want prayer requests, you could go to the applicable section on our website, www.slcoc.org, and you can fill out the response card or the prayer request, whichever is the case, and we'll contact you. We'll pray for you. If you want to be baptized, we'll, we'll contact you and see to it that you are baptized. And so, so um, we just thank you again for tuning in. We don't want to see it end, but we're just blessed to be able uh, to conduct this gospel uh, revival. We're also thankful for our church family here at the Sugarland Church for uh, supporting this revival. And I, I know that each of us gained so much from it. Uh, we're just thankful to uh, our media and technology team for working so hard and putting this event uh, together. Our family care minister, Brother Wendell Hart, 
and Hearts Publishing, y'all. We're just so thank. There's so many intricate parts that went into the development of this gospel meet, and we're just thankful to everybody. But most of all, we're thankful to God. To God be all glory, praise, dominion, and honor forever and ever, y'all. God is such an awesome God, and and uh, yeah, look, I, I could preach tonight. I'm not gonna do that though. I'm not gonna do that. But uh, we just want to say thank you for tuning in with us. Hope to see you soon. God bless you. God keep you. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father, we want to thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. We've been granted to hear your word proclaimed throughout the week. Father, as we come to the close of uh, this virtual revival meeting, Father, we're thankful for the theme, the time is now. Father, may we, may we be receptive to those things that have been said from the pages of inspiration. Father, we're thankful for Christ and what he should mean to each and every one of us. And we're thankful for Brother Jackson as he has on this night proclaimed your word. Father, may we receive it with meekness and understanding. And Father, we're just so thankful for your word and the power that it has to change lives. And Father, we just want to give you praise and honor for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. And Father, as we come to this close, may we be receptive to all those things that were said this past week. And may we find in ourselves the areas where we need to be obedient and strengthen ourselves and look to you for all of our source of strength. Is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Jesus, you've been good to me. Jesus, you've been good, so good to me. Oh, Jesus, you've been good. I met a man when I was oppressed by sin. He opened up his heart and he laid me in. Oh, he lifted me from wrong and set me on my way. so good so good and strong all i can say You've been good, oh, so good to me. And let me tell you about this man. He's been so good to me. He's always by my side, just like he said. When I go weak and fall, he's always there to grab my hand. You choose your ground, but as for me, with him I'm gonna stand. With my Jesus and I know, Jesus, you've been never, ever, ever so good. Jesus, Jesus.
Jesus. You've been good, ever, ever, ever so good. Jesus, you've been good to me. You've been good, ever so good. You've been good, so good to me. Don't you know I know that Jesus, he's been so good to me. I've lost some loved ones and close friends along the way, but he still helps me through each day, and I